there's a lot of people out there that might be talking about certain strategies that are saying certain advice that you should be following, but you go out there and break a lot of myths that you've seen happen year after year. So I'd love to know from your perspective and where you are now, what are some of the biggest things you're seeing in the market that are noisy, but are not giving the people the advice they need to get to the next level? Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> how much time do we have, Jason? How much time do we have? So I think there's a couple of things. There is marketing for the sake of marketing. There is branding for the sake of branding. And then there is the, the focused sales activity that you need to do that I call MMA. One of my early mentors says to me, David, anything that you're doing that is not MMA, you should stop doing. And I said, what's MMA? He says, money-making activity, money-making activity direct to prospect activity, talking to prospects, talking to clients, talking to economic decision makers. What are you doing besides that? You can probably cut 90% of that out of your life, out of your day, out of your routine, because there is so much monkey work and busy work. And uh, I almost call it avoidance work, right? Because people, and I know that you write about this, Jason, you're brilliant at unpacking this. Before experiencing you, people hate sales. They just absolutely hate it. They would rather do anything else. They would rather procrastinate. They'd rather jump on social media. They're like, hey, I'm going to put a, put a post on LinkedIn and that's my sales activity for today. It's like, folks, that's not sales activity. There is marketing activity, there's visibility activity, there's credibility activity, and then there's sales activity. And I think everything that we do to procrastinate or avoid or hide or delay or defer money-making activity is quite literally costing you money every single day. Mm, amen to that. And you're right. Like This is something I witness as well so much is that we can do anything except the sales activity because it's laced with so much fear and baggage. And this is a lot of stuff that I definitely unpacked as well. But I'd, I'd be curious to know from your perspective, like what do you feel are the biggest fears that are making people avoid sales at all costs when they know they want to generate more revenue and have more success? And that is the activity that needs to happen. Well, I think it's a couple of things. I, I think when you don't know what you're doing, right, you, you don't have some expertise in how this is going to work. I mean, think about, think about your first date when you had no idea about dating or conversations or what to say or what to ask or what to do. Do I hold the door? Do I not hold the door? Do I, you know, do I offer to meet there? Should I give her a ride? I, I, I don't know. There's a million questions that I don't know. So in middle school and high school, my dating life was close to zero because I had no idea what I was doing. This is about familiarity. This is about uh, training. This is about understanding how to play the game by the rules that you create that for you are easy, effortless, and enjoyable. So sales activity is nothing more than invitations and conversations. I think one thing that we can just maybe democratize this process for everyone, because generally speaking, no one's afraid of an invitation. An invitation generally is followed by good things, popcorn, candy, bourbon, bacon, right? You're invited to a party. Conversation is also something that's not scary. What's a conversation? A conversation is an exchange of ideas. A conversation is a way to make new friends. A conversation is to have a door opening um, dialogue with someone who might be able to help you, you might be able to help them. There may be some mutual interest. There may be some fun that you can have together. There may be some business that you can do together. So I think if we reframe this whole, the S word, as I call it in the Do It Marketing book, there's a whole chapter on sales. It's actually probably one third of the Do It Marketing book is really about sales, but don't tell them. The S word, you can delete the S word from your vocabulary. Replace it with send invitations and spark conversations. And I think the fear factor and the avoidance factor will go way, way down. <laughs> I also have a bit of a 
um, a reveal, a secret to share, which is in my Selling with Love book, uh, I think a third of it is marketing. So it's it, I, I understand how they, it's weird, right? They need to work together. Totally. But I find that so important what you mentioned, because when you have so much baggage that's attached to the word sales, substituting that word to just take away that edge, just to make sure you do it as you would encourage, um, is one of the key things I teach people as well for them to overcome that initial fear. Well, one thing I find very interesting with the way that you you know, work with the types of clients that you have, which are usually over a hundred thousand, is that there's a different set of foundations that need to be in place for someone to find themselves to be at a hundred thousand. And I don't know about you, but I've noticed that for most people where let's say they're below 50 or below a hundred, there's so much mindset work that it doesn't matter what strategies you teach. And I'm wondering if you're seeing the same and that's why you speak about the difference below and above a hundred thousand. Yes, for sure. And I think, so for folks listening, as an entrepreneur, we have this sort of mythical barrier of having a six-figure business or a multi-six-figure business that somehow all your problems go away once you're generating one hundred dollars or $200,000 in your business. Now, Jason will tell you that's not true. I will tell Just you that's not true. You simply have better problems, higher order problems, and so forth. But I do want to talk about some of the foundational differences about the different challenges that we face, the different questions that you're probably asking yourself, and some of the risks and some of the actions that you should take at a couple of different levels in your business. So obviously, if you're just starting out or restarting your entrepreneurial business, your challenge is clarity. And it's specifically clarity around people you serve and problems that you solve. Your operative question is how do I start? What does a prospect even look like? Jason, when I started out, I literally, I had no idea about the sales process at all. And I took some sales training from a local guru. And he says, okay, so you're talking to a prospect. He lost me at sentence one. I'm like, wait a minute, where do I find this mythical prospect? And when you say you're talking, what is it that I'm saying or asking? this mythical prospect. So literally the basic 101 level, I had no idea what was going on. So that's what I mean by how do I start? Main risk at that level is confusion and idea churn. The best thing you can do is make some big, bold decisions because decisions drive action and action drives results. That decision-making mindset, because you mentioned mindset is so important at that level, Understanding that this is a serious business. Yes, you want to have fun. Yes, you want to make your marketing and sales activity easy, effortless, and enjoyable. Yes, you take your clients seriously. Yes, you take your work seriously. The only thing that you're not supposed to take seriously is yourself. So have a little self deprecating humor. But that mindset that I am in this as a professional and a professional, one of the definitions of the word professional is I get paid for what I do. So once you have that dialed in, that will set your foundation. The next level, and again, we're now kind of approaching 100K per year-ish. The next challenge is focus. There are so many entrepreneurs that freely admit that they have entrepreneurial ADD. And if we just add a layer of focus, focus on not only the foundation that you've built, but now what does the next level look like? How do I grow? How do I avoid distraction? How do I avoid overwhelm? How do I organize some of my activities? How do I organize some of my marketing tasks? How do I organize some of my sales tasks? So here, for example, the concept of a CRM might come into play for the first time. Like, oh, I've got more leads than I can keep track of on my little index cards here. I better find some way to organize my sales activity. Here's where you want to really zero in on marketing, articulation, distinction, separating yourself from all the other professionals who look like or sound like they do what you do and really dial in your positioning so that you become a category of one. And interestingly, when I first started Do It Marketing, Do It was an acronym. So obviously I'm an action-taking kind of guy, Do It, but it's also about decide, organize, implement, and track design, organize, implement, and track. So design is basically make those foundational decisions, 
organize is decide what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, move things from your to-do list to your calendar. Implement is take action, remove the monkey work and the busy work, focus on MMA. And then T, track your results, track your revenue, track your sales, track your closing ratio, track your prospecting success. If you do those things, your elevation and escalation past 100K and probably even past the first couple hundred thousand dollars of your entrepreneurial business are pretty much guaranteed. Hmm. Yeah, I could see also that there's probably a big transition in the way that you operate once you've started going for the activities you're talking about, being more organized at 100K plus, because before you get there, it's a bit more chaotic, isn't it? I feel like that would be okay. So I'd love to know, David, when you past that six figure, which I know is like this mystical figure, what with inflation, maybe we'll all be making six figures in a few months, right? Seriously. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, what do you think is one of the biggest habits that we have that got us there, but hold us back from going beyond? I think this idea of doing everything yourself and being a company of one. And when people are making 125, 150, maybe even 200 K, they say, well, I don't really have the money to hire a virtual assistant. You know, once I hit the next level, once I'm at 250 or 300, then I can get that virtual assistant. Out of all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs that I've worked with, the ones that have a virtual assistant, which I think should be everyone's first hire, consistently and almost to a person, they say, I wish I had done this sooner. So when you think you can't afford it, that's when you actually need it because that's what's going to propel you to that 300, 400, 500K level much, much faster if you've been flatlining at 150K, 200K, wherever you are, because you're flying solo, that's what's holding you back is you're flying solo and you don't have someone to delegate. You don't have someone to take the repetitive, I call it intelligent grunt work. The intelligent grunt work that happens in your business, if you're the one doing it, there's a saying, if you don't have a VA, then you are the VA. And you do not want to be the virtual assistant in your own business because you're probably a $500 an hour person or a $1,000 an hour person and you're doing $25 an hour work. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something to uh, put into perspective because at the same time, I think people uh, fail to understand how accessible it is to get a VA and how when you're hiring them, you shouldn't be thinking about an annual salary of say like 50, 70,000, but you have to think about maybe you're hiring somebody part-time, which makes it even more accessible than what we imagine. And so I'm glad that that was shared and that is reinforced because I know for myself, a uh, funny story is while I had a job, so I was working at Mind Valley. Um, and I decided, hey, if I had a VA, I'd do better in this position. So even as a salaried employee, I'd end up getting my own virtual assistant, which everybody was like, wow, Jason is so organized. He's really ahead of everyone. And so everyone was really impressed. And then at some point I went to my employer and they were negotiating my salary. And I said, you know what? I appreciate my salary, but I'd love for you to start paying for the VA that I've hired for myself. So I'll send you their invoices and you can reimburse me because it's been key to my productivity. So they ended up reimbursing my entire hire because it brought results to the company. So even as an employee, it's something I might suggest some people to consider if you're in a very, um, let's say, modern organization that would tolerate such activities. <laughs> now, David, as we're going to be um, going deeper into these 100K plus types of strategies, you mentioned earlier that we might find ourselves being distracted or unfocused on these non-MMA activities. You talked about branding and social media. But I'd be curious to know, are you saying these activities are useless or what are the ways that we could look at them that actually make them become MMA activities? So great, great question. And, and yes, of course, they can be converted into MMA activities. So earlier I said, hey, I'm just going to post on LinkedIn and look at me. I'm doing sales activity. Posting on LinkedIn is not MMA and it's not sales activity. Posting on LinkedIn and sending that to three prospects in an email. Hey, Barbara, I remember last week we were talking about some of your leadership challenges. I just posted this on LinkedIn. Feel free to have a look at it. If you think it's valuable, feel free to share it with your team. So you're, you're nurturing, you're moving a sale forward, whether that's first contact, second contact, third contact, maybe it's about to close. But 
looking at your entire pipeline, and I know that concept is new for some people, but looking at your entire pipeline, who can I move one step closer to a check, not by following up, not by pestering them, not by basically calling up and saying, hey, just circling back. Hey, just wanted to check in because that's a value-free follow-up, value-rich follow-up, links, articles, resources, what you posted on LinkedIn, something that came across your email inbox. One of the most powerful things you can do to move sales forward in general is to act as if you've already been hired, share resources, share ideas, share links, share tools, just as you do with your best clients and your favorite clients, do that with prospects. And if the start, the moment you start treating prospects like clients, you will get a whole lot more clients. That's an interesting mindset shift because some people might be thinking, wow, I'm going to be wasting all my time with these prospects. Uh, but from your perspective, you're saying this is one of the key activities to start turning them into clients. It really is. It really is. So think about once you're hired and someone sends you a big juicy check and you're doing all kinds of amazing things for this organization, you're speaking, you're doing workshops, you're doing executive coaching, you're doing all of your magic and you're totally amazing. This is what we call post sale value. All of us are being paid to deliver post sale value. What's missing so many times is pre-sale value. How are you adding value? How are you being relevant? How are you helping them before any money changes hands? Because often if you don't do enough in the pre-sale value, you will not get the chance to deliver your post-sale value because they're not going to buy. So I think the needle has moved on how we treat prospects versus how we treat clients. And clients get, the only thing clients get that prospects should not get is guided implementation, right? I will help you implement. I will help you make this real. I will help you get traction. I will keep you accountable. We will keep you moving forward. Information is a commodity. Information wants to be free. I would even argue these days information is free. The internet does not need more information from you or from me or from anybody, right? There's billions and billions and billions of gigabytes of information. What we really need to put into our pre-sale value is insights, insights, recommendations, ideas, uh, things that will help your prospects see their problem differently, see their uh, situation differently, possibly even see some solutions differently. And this is all about reframing the thought process. There's a fantastic book, Jason, I'm sure you know it. It's called The Challenger Sale. The Challenger Sale is about being a more provocative seller. And we're, we're thought provoking. We're saying, well, you thought about the problem this way, but the real problem is over here that way. Or you're looking at the surface level problem, but what we found is that the underlying problems are typically area one, area two, area three. Now you do this very diplomatically. You don't do it like I just did it like a lecture. You do it through a series of strategic questions and peeling the onion and really being a great diagnostician. Once you do that, economic buyers will say, wow, this person is really smart. This person really has some insights that I hadn't thought of before. Maybe this is the person that has the most insightful, most effective, most powerful solution to the problem that we think we have here at the company. So I'll, I'll leave this little concept with a tagline, low-level people want their questions answered. High-level people want their answers questioned. I love how you frame that, and it's so true. And so, as such, you actually speak a lot about finding the right clients, and I think that's one pain point that some, some of us will find. My God, I sometimes want to reframe who are the people I work with because... Dealing with different types of clients, you get a treatment and a relationship and even a compensation that can be radically different. And all you're changing is who you decide to work with. Now, I don't know if we're suggesting that we should not be working with anyone below a certain business revenue, 
uh, or you're just focused on certain types of clients. But I wanted to hear your perspective here about how important it is to choose the right clients and what are some of the criteria we should look for to make sure that we're working with the right kind of people. Well, I think the the key thing here is to look at desire, urgency, relevance, and budget. So first of all, there are problems that executives and companies and entrepreneurs have that they just don't want to fix. It's not important to them. So the desire is really, really low. So it's the the traditional fat smoker. It's like, hey, stop eating bonbons and, you know, chain smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I'm good. I'm fine. I don't think I have a problem. The person's pre-diabetic. They're going to die by age 50 of cancer, but who knows, right? But they don't see it as a problem. As much as you see it as a problem, you're wasting your time. So let's talk about urgency. This is about moving from nice to have to have to have. And this is sometimes based on trigger events Something that was a nice to have three months ago might be a have to have today because if there's some emerging situation, there's some opportunity, whether that's merger, acquisition, upsizing, downsizing, market forces, compliance, regulatory, new opportunity, new risk, who knows what has happened. But newsjacking is a fantastic way to kind of tap into what's happening in the marketplace with a given company or in a given industry and see how your solution is now immediately more urgent than it was three months ago and also more more urgent than it will be three months from now. So urgency is another really big one. Relevance is how much research are you doing before you're actually making contact? Are you copying and pasting the same exact message a hundred times on LinkedIn? Are you batch and blasting emails? Are you doing silly cold calling with no relevance and no specificity? The more that you research before the call, the more success you will have on the call. So the mantra there is research before reach out. So every single buyer that we ever talk to, Jason, has three questions when they get that email or they get that call or they get that LinkedIn message. The three questions are, why this? Why me? Why now? So why why am I getting this? Why is this relevant? right? To what's, what's, what's happening. Why are they sending this to me? Right? If I'm the CEO, I'm not the one buying janitorial services, but this janitorial services company, it's like they need to talk to our facilities person. So you failed the why me test. And then why now it's like, what are we going through right now that makes this especially relevant or especially uh, a hot topic Did you read something in the business journal? Was there a press release? Was there something covered in the media? Uh, Did something go up? Did something go down? So literally, those three questions, if you can triangulate the research that you're doing to answer why me, why this, why now, you will get a lot more initial conversations with a lot higher level people. I absolutely love that. And It brings a level of segmentation just because you will have limited time if you want to reach out to people and make these answers be clear, which means you can't just be blindly trying to get business with anybody. You have to become now very intentional on who will I put in effort because you spoke about budget as well. And not everybody is going to have the budget to work with someone like you. And so what are some of the things that you look for? Is it something that you screen very quickly initially? Uh, and, and what would you do for anybody that might not have any budget, but you still want to help them? So there's there's a couple things. My friend Ellen Malco Moore talks about finding people that are uh, ATP and ETP. ATP is able to pay. ETP is eager to pay. And these are people that have high level problems and they have a high level of urgency because it's expensive for them to keep this problem. So it's either expensive in terms of time, money, energy, bandwidth, team, opportunity cost, whatever it is. So this is the intersection between your messaging about what you do and who you do it for and who you do your best work with and when. So for example, one of the things you can do to start filtering and sorting and triangulating on these people who are able to pay and eager to pay is on your LinkedIn or on the homepage of your website, simply say the following. So Jason, I know you're a speaker. I'm a speaker as well. 
we do speaking, we do consulting, we do other sorts of things. As a speaker, you might say, Jason's clients and audiences tend to work with him when they're experiencing one or more of the following. And then it's just a whole bunch of situational observable conditions, right? When the sales team isn't performing the way that they used to, when no one's hitting quota, when you have kind of a miserable a culture among your sales team and there's too much gossip gab in the grapevine, people have lost, they've lost the love, they've lost the mission, they've lost the vision of why this company was founded and they've lost that DNA in the sales process. So literally... Clients tend to hire us when, and then all of these situational triggers, so they know when to pick up the bat phone. And they identify, not with your services and programs, because no one buys our services and programs, they identify with their own situation, conditions, problems, complaints, etc. That's when they pick up the phone and go, Jason, I just saw the homepage of your website, I just got your email, and uh, it felt like you were talking to me, so I had to call. I literally felt like you were talking to me, that you wrote that web page for me. You wrote that LinkedIn profile for me. Someone said I should come check you out. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy must have installed video cameras in our meeting rooms. He must have installed listening devices on our telephones because he knows exactly what's going on in here. Yeah. Know your problem or your prospect's problem even better than they know it themselves. And that comes from being so clear on who you serve. And so I'm glad that you reinforced that because you're right. When you get to have that kind of conversation, that's where copy comes in place and is so important because you will attract the people that you try to speak to. And I've made the mistake many times. And, you know, I came from, you know, a background of being very much into personal growth. And there was a lot of, you know, coaches getting started initially and I have a natural attraction to be to my message, telling them to sell with love, et cetera. And I love helping these people for sure. But when I want to focus my, my energy on the higher level clients, then I have to realize that a lot of the people I get to help at that level get to be helped through my marketing, not my product. They're not my yes. clients. They're the people that follow, that recommend me, that share my message so that I can reach the clients that I want who go to my say the socials. And this is where I see it all ties together. They go to the socials, they go to the brand. They're like, oh, wow, look, there's a lot of people saying good things here. Now right. I get to see, well, who's exactly my client? It's a very different person. Do you, do you find that's a strategy that you've applied as well, where there's a certain group that is like, hey, they're just going to benefit from my marketing? Totally, totally. Uh, there's, there's some unkind terms for those people, tire kickers, price shoppers, goofballs, but you're absolutely right. I'm going to hold a very high bar here for our listeners. You want your marketing to be so good that A, I love what Jason, you're saying, people should get results just from consuming your marketing. That's kind of a scary thought. Number two, some people, and this might take you a year or two to get here, some people will feel so indebted to you for your marketing, meaning the emails that you send out, the videos that you post, the webinars that you present, they will feel so indebted to you, they will actually start to write you checks. And you will get checks for $50 or $100 or $180 saying, Jason, I'm not in a position to hire you, but I have learned so much. I have implemented so much. I felt compelled to share this little bit of money with you. Thank you for doing what you do. And what they're talking about is thank you for your marketing. Thank you for your webinars. Thank you for your emails. Thank you for your blog posts. Thank you for your free trainings. I have had this happen to me maybe half a dozen times in the last 20 years. And each and every time that tells me that my marketing is heading in the right direction because people will literally and I, of course, I have photocopies of the checks and I have screenshots of the Venmo and I've got little screenshots of the PayPal messages. These make my day sometimes even more so than a $20,000, $40,000, $50,000 client. That client's going to get amazing, fantastic transformational value, but it's the person who couldn't afford to work with me that has made some changes, implemented some ideas and gotten some results so much so that they felt compelled to write me a small check or send a small, a small gift. 
uh, that's when you know that you've got some good things going on. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And I, I'm so grateful for how things have become much more mainstream to accept this, that marketing is a tool that can help so many people that might not be in a position to help you. Uh, that can't pay for it financially right now. And there's so many resources that are accessible. And, you know, you host your podcast, which by the way, everyone, I'll make sure you have a link to in the show notes so you can go and listen to David's podcast. It's a fantastic platform where there's amazing guests sharing some ideas around marketing, sales, and speaking as well. With that, David, I had one question I want to ask you, which I thought was quite particular. And I think it's something we should be addressing. In a world where a lot of the promises are fast, fast, fast results, I was actually quite uh, relieved to see that within your own bio and your own copy, you talk about getting people results within 15 months, which seems like results that could be over a long term. What do you think is going on with the whole get rich quick and get solutions now and how we need to actually act a little differently to actually bring sustainable results for people? Yes. Well, I'm going to give you a cynical answer and then I'm going to give you a, a real genuine answer. The cynical answer is exactly as you're saying, Jason, Everyone is promising quick fix. We're going to fix this in 21 days. We're going to fix this in seven days. We're going to fix this in, you know, whatever. And, and so those claims are getting tired. So just as a marketer, I wanted to move away from the crazy look alike, sound alike folks out there. The genuine answer is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. So having been an entrepreneur now for 21 plus years, I know that I took way too long to figure some things out, but I also know that the quick fixes typically don't last. So if people are willing to invest 12 months, 15 months, 18 months, their business and their revenue will look dramatically different 12 months or 15 months or 18 months from now. And the promise that you're talking about, our little tagline that I have on LinkedIn and some other places is that we help independent professionals grow by 50% to 500% within 15 months. So we have an endless amount of testimonials, written videos, screenshots, letters, emails, uh, not insignificant numbers, like 80 of them, 85 of them, I think, at last count. And so that is overwhelming, overwhelming evidence that when we say, you go from a $100,000 business to a $300,000 business. Well, David, how long will that take? You know, should that take eight or nine years like it took me? Heck no, absolutely not. Can you do that in the next 12 to 15 to 18 months with some focus, structure, guidance, accountability, and, and mentorship? Absolutely. But here's the other thing. And, and you know this, Jason, from your own business and your own journey. Very few of us do anything great alone. Everything comes from mentors and guides and teachers along the way. And so I think there's another demarcation point that are people stubborn and are they, I'm going to do it myself and I'm, I, I know what I want and I don't need help and it's, it shows weakness to ask for help. What, and that's, that's where I used to be. And I, I would say that's where my business, you know, people ask me sometimes, David, what's, what's the biggest regret you have in your business? And looking at all the fantastic coaches and mentors and masterminds that have really impacted my business, I refuse to invest for way too long in the first five years of my business. And I shudder to think where I would be today if I had invested earlier, not necessarily more, but earlier in reaching out for help and being vulnerable and acknowledging to myself mainly that I did not have all the answers and I was far from the smartest guy in the room. But I was, you know, I, I figured, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs do everything by themselves. We do it. That's the whole point is we're solo. We're, we're you know, we're Kirk, Spock, Uhura, and Scotty all in one person. Star Trek fans, you know what I'm talking about there. Now, every ship needs a crew. Right. And every every superhero needs the sidekick and the team behind them. So you can't figure this out on your own. And if you look at every mentor and every rock star that you might be looking up to, you know, Tony Robbins had Jim Rohn and uh, just, you know, you name it. Every single person had someone else 
guiding them, sharing with them, standing on the shoulders of giants. If you're not willing to take your place in that line of greatness and be willing to be mentored and guided and helped by other people, especially I think people in the consulting, coaching and speaking world, typically we are the helpers. We're great at giving the help. We're often not that great at asking for it. That's a powerful reminder. And, you know, for even myself, I see that I'm often trying to think that I have all the answers. And by being on the podcast and being having a chance to bring amazing guests like you, I'm always getting so much wisdom from you as mentors. And so I'm so grateful that you came to share with us today, David. This was amazing. There's one question I always ask my guests when they come on the show, because you are on the Selling with Love podcast. I wanted to ask you, what does selling with love mean to you? Ah, oh, so good. Selling with love is about getting back to the original intention, I think, of the sales profession, which is helping other people and standing for the highest in your profession when you hold their interests above your own. So people say, well, David, you're kind of a relentless salesperson. And I am a relentless salesperson, not because I need the money or I need the client, I am relentless in wanting to help as many people as I possibly can. And I can't help you unless we work together. So in that, in that context, it's like, man, you are just, you're like, you're like just relentless. I'm relentless with love. I'm relentless with care. I'm relentless with concern and curiosity and a genuine desire to help because I know that if people don't avail themselves of some kind of help from me or from someone that they will suffer unnecessarily. And I think selling with love is about helping people not have to suffer unnecessarily. David, I absolutely love that answer. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Everything you speak about, the values you hold are definitely making you a prized guest on this show. And for everybody listening, definitely, if you're resonating with David's message, pick up Do It Marketing, Do It Speaking, and soon to be Do It Selling. And of course, you'll be able to register to his podcast. I love your vibes, David. I'm so grateful to have you on the show. Thank you for everything you've shared today. And for everybody else listening, be sure to keep selling with love. 